morning. So good to be back in person and see faces. What a wonderful time. So thanks for being here. This is a tour of the modern Java platform. And I'm James Ward. I'm uh, of recent, a, now a Kotlin product manager at Google. So that's my, my new job. Uh, Ryan Knight. I'm CEO of Grand Cloud. We're a small fintech consulting company. We do a lot of like back-end distributed data platforms. So. All right, so let's dive in. We got a lot of code to show you, but before we get into some code, let's talk about modern, uh, what that means. So the way that I look at modern is that it's when something makes it easier to deal with increased complexity. So we have, in the systems that we build, complexity seems to always be growing. There's business requirements that are always changing and evolving and getting more complicated. The technical problems that we're solving continue to get more, uh, more <laughs> difficult. We have global scale issues to deal with. We have uh, performance, data size issues. Like Things just keep getting more and more complex. And so the way that I look at modern, it's like, the things that make it easier to deal with that increased complexity, those are the things that I call modern. But modern is a spectrum. So we can take, uh, maybe you're a Java developer, there's probably a few things that you can do to uh, take some baby steps to be a little bit more modern. And we'll show you some of that today. And then maybe there's some things that you can take some larger steps to that would be harder to do maybe in an organization or harder to do this year uh, that would help you to be modern, more modern. Um, but it still would be on the spectrum of what modern, what I'd consider modern. And then maybe there's some like giant leaps, which we're not going to get into today, but Ryan and I do a lot of Scala and really like um, some new things in Scala that I think are some large leaps ahead in terms of modernness. Uh, and we're not going to go into those today, but there, there is a spectrum. And today we're going to try to paint just some baby steps and then some larger steps in things that you can do to modernize your applications. So let's start with some language features, which are things that hopefully are on the more easy side of the spectrum of adoption. And to, uh, to dive into this, we're going to first talk about something called algebraic data types. So tell us about algebraic data types. Yeah, an algebraic data type is you can basically think of it as a data value that has a fixed set of like some t uh, subtypes. So as an example, you could have like a vehicle, and you can say a vehicle can only be like a car, truck, or a motorcycle. And you want to have a way of, uh, so the compiler can enforce that I only have a certain set of subtypes for that. So I have like a class hierarchy, and I want to enforce the class hierarchy only has a couple of types. So do you want to show us how that's actually used? Yeah, let's dive in. And so what Ryan was describing was a sum type. And there's two, primarily two different types of algebraic data mm -hmm. types. There's the sum type, uh, and then there's also a product type. And they use those algebraic words. And so, you know, if you're into math, you can like uh, start to see some associations with why they're called product types and some types when we get into them. But the we're going to start with the product types, and you um, you probably will will recognize product types because they are pretty commonly used in uh, a number of different languages and and places. But the way to do a product type in Java now, the best way is with a new record. So records are now part of the Java language as of JDK 17. And when we define a record, which is like a product type, we can set the values on, in that product type. So I can have a point that it has an x and a y property. And the, one of the really nice things with records is that I don't have to create all the out-of-the-box methods for toString and hash code and equals. I just get all those for free. But then also I get immutable uh, values. It just uh, by default, the values inside of a record are immutable. And I love immutability. Uh, it's definitely changed a lot of how I build my programs. And um, you want to tell us about immutability and, and I don't know, yeah. what you, how you've, you've experienced well, it? I think the biggest thing for me is immutability has helped me deal with concurrency. Because so you have a, a immutable variable, you know what you, you know, and you have multiple threads, you can guarantee that where that value is actually being modified or not being modified, I should say, It just right? can't be modified. It can't be modified. So like, um, the other thing is, like, if I pass it to a function, I can guarantee that from the, you know, that function is actu actually going to be modifying that value inside of the function. So I can guarantee that when that value is passed in, that it won't be modified. So I can guarantee the results of that function. So they talk about referential integrity. 
right? So that I can guarantee that the function always does what is expected, and immutable values help with that. So. Yeah, just for me, it makes it so that I, I can place expectations around how a program or a function works, and things don't magically change out from underneath me. So it makes my programs a lot easier to follow. So the way that I program now is like everything that I can make immutable, I do. And um, yeah. Yeah, I think readability is a huge thing. Like with the immutable values, it makes it a lot easier to read through a program because I know like where that value is actually being set and that it won't be changed like farther down in the, the, the program. So it makes readability much easier. Yep. Yeah, you can logically follow the flow of mutation with immutability. OK, so uh, to create our point, we have a constructor. And this is another new language syntax thing that I like in Java is the type inference, where I don't have to say the usual point on the left side. I can just say var. And for me, that's a, a more readable style of syntax. Um, but we will notice here that if I try to mutate my x in my point, that it's like, you can't do that. x is immutable. So that's, that's nice there. Uh, we do get the out of the box to string. So if I print out my point, then it will look nice. And then one other thing that I wanted to show here was a nice new feature in Java, which is the multi-line text blocks. So let's, let's run that so we can just see what it looks like with our um, our point printed out. Oh, and I I forgot to actually test running this one. I don't know why why it's not working. But oh well, we won't run that one. <laughs> Anyways, you can try it on your own. You can print out. Uh, you, you, it'll print just exactly like you'd expect it to. Okay, so that's the records in Java 17. Definitely a good improvement. Um, and those are like uh, product types in the class of algebraic data types. So now let's go on to the one that Ryan was describing, which is a sum type. And with a sum type, uh, what we can do is we can say, all right, I've got this thing that is sealed. And sealed is what allows me to make it a sum type. And so when I seal something, I then have to tell it where the possible implementations of that come from. And so I've got a sealed interface called robot, and I'm telling it that the only three implementations that can exist of a robot are a vacuum, a snowblower, and a lawnmower. And this is one syntax you can use. I actually technically didn't need to do this because by default, the sealed will, uh, anything that's defined in the same file will be able to, to be one of those sealed types. So you don't have to do the permits if it's in the same file. But if you have another implementation that's outside of this file, then you would uh, have to explicitly specify the permits. So, okay, so I'm permitting that the only valid robots are vacuum, snowblower, and lawnmower. And now I'm creating my vacuum, my snowblower, my lawnmower instances. And here's where we start to see the value of some types is let's say we have a function that takes a robot as a parameter. Now, uh, we can already see some of the benefits here of the sum type. Like, I can't say, is this thing an instance of a string? Because that sum type, there's no way that a sum type of robot can be a string. And the compiler knows that. So it's not going to even let us uh, do that check. It just is, is inv an invalid check there. So we can do that is instance of and then do the cast that you may be familiar with. But there's a new way to do this where we can do the, uh, the is instance of and the cast all in one step here where we give it the variable identifier. So that's the, the new way to do this like pattern match or type, I call it a type predicate cast. Um, but there's a, another way that we can handle this type of stuff which is using pattern matching. So with pattern matching, what we do is we switch on robot, and then we handle the cases for our sum types. And so the, nice, the really nice thing that we get with sum types is the ability to have exhaustive checking, where if I comment out one of these robot, uh, types of robots, now the compiler can verify for me that I have handled all the possible cases of robot. And it'll actually be a compile error if I have forgotten to handle a particular case of robot. So this exhaustive pattern matching is really where the sum types have a lot of benefit. Uh, one of the places that this gets used is to replace the visitor pattern. If you've done the visitor pattern, we can now replace that with sum types and pattern matching. Um, so lots of, of nice stuff there. And of course, we can also add in a default handler. So we can say, all right, in the default case, you know, do something else, whatever. Uh, so that's the way that we can handle, not have to specify all our different types, but then still have a default, and then that would be exhaustive. 
Okay, so that's our sum types from algebraic data types and, uh, and good stuff in there. Anything to add on ADTs and sum types? No, I, I really like the switch statement, being able to, to, you know, switch statements are so common in programming, of like trying to say, well, if it's this, then do this, if they do this. This is a much safer way than the old school, like is instance of and doing the old cast and always getting runtime exceptions, so. Yeah, and, and I definitely had bugs in my code because I forgot to handle a, a certain case, time. and now that the compiler is making mm -hmm. sure that then, I like, handle all the cases yes. that I need to. And the syntax looks nice and concise. Okay, so that is our sum types. Let's go on to the next one here, which is uh, another thing that I think is a nice newer feature uh, in Java is better uh, null handling or null error messages. So um, in the world of Java, we can get null pointer exceptions. And so I've got a structure of records. I've got a plumbus, uh, which has a string, a thing, which has a plumbus, and a meseeks, which has a thing. So just a structure of records here. And you'll see when I create my first one, uh, I have everything initialized, no nulls, but then my second one, my plumbus is null. So I'm building up to being able to have a null pointer exception. And so now I can do, use another new thing in Java, which is these nice helpers for creating lists and sets and that sort of thing. So I create my set of my meseeks, and then I iterate through each one, and I traverse down into the it.thing.plumbus.s and, and print it out. And let's see if I can run this one or if I screwed up my, my uh, I totally screwed it up somehow. You broke That's everything, I, bro I broke everything. Don't know how I broke it. But what we would see if that was working, actually, I think I can make it work real quick. I added in Kotlin to this project at the last minute, and that's always a bad idea to add in stuff. You don't at want the to last change minute. your build at the last minute. You, yeah, never change your build at the last minute. Just a bad idea. Let's let's see if we can get this thing to work. It's just Kotlin. We want to see the null pointer exception. There we go. Now it worked. Okay. I don't know why adding Kotlin <laughs> broke it, but um, now okay. We threw our null pointer exception, and if we look into the error message here, we can see that it's telling us cannot read field S because, and it tells you exactly what was null. So definitely an improvement if you are troubleshooting null pointer exceptions in production to have that information. I can't remember how many times I've gone through and said, is this one null or if not, is this one null? Like you have to check all the layers down and especially you have like five layers of checking of like, is this null, is this null? And trying to find what was null before. So yeah. this is really nice. To much better. So that's a good improvement, something that definitely will help us be more modern. Okay, so now I wanted to show um, in Kotlin some nullability stuff. So hopefully we, the, the Kotlin um, plugin now will work. And so I want to show in Kotlin, I think, another step forward in terms of null handling. While we're talking about null handling, uh, I think that it's there, there are, have been some improvements in languages for how you deal with nulls. And in the case of Kotlin, what we can do is I can create an int and set it to a value. Uh, and in that case, that value is non-nullable. And so that, uh, that i, uh, it can't be null. We can't initialize that to a null value. Uh, but let's say we do want it to be null then what we can do is put a question mark at the end of the type. And so Kotlin has a parallel type system for every type for the nullable types. And so what we can do is explicitly say that this thing can be null. I think that uh, the compiler won't even let us, if we try this, we cannot actually set that first one to null because it's like, hey, you can't, you can't do that. Uh, this int is not a nullable type, so it has to have a value. But to set that j to a nullable value, then we can put that question mark at the end. So what this uh, means is that now with explicit nullability, we have to handle nullability. It forces us as the developer to deal with the cases where things can be null. And so if I have my i, which is non-nullable, I can just call a method on it like increment. And let's set that to a new variable there. And this is going to still be an uh, int. But on my j, my nullable one, let's create a new variable here. If I try to call my j.increment, what's happening is it's like, no, you, you can't do that because if 
if j is null, then this is going to be a null pointer exception. And so what I then have to do is say j question mark to say, all right, in the case where j is not null, then increment it. And then our type that we get out of this is a, non, uh, is a nullable int. So the nullability propagates through the chain. And anytime we want to continue down trying to access things in nullable types, we have to use that question mark. So if we did want this to be a, a non-null int, then what we could do is provide a default. So I can say, all right, in the case where, uh, where it is null, now provide the default value, and now I don't have to propagate that nullability out. So by, by having explicit nullability, we're forced to deal with it, and that alleviates the null pointer exceptions. Yeah, and so we've actually been migrating one of our legacy systems from Java over to Kotlin. And one of the biggest benefits we've seen is the old Java system had a large number of null pointer exceptions. So you have these code paths that don't get touched for you know, weeks or months. All of a sudden you get a null pointer exception in production, and it's never been handled, and it's a lot of problems. And so moving over to Kotlin, you're forced to handle things properly, and it's completely I mean, eliminated our null pointer exceptions in production, which has made our lives a lot simpler. So it's been a huge advantage to properly handle null, nulls. So. And we um, do this in the world of Scala with it's options. Sense. And you can use optionals in Java, mm -hmm. but the ecosystem usually in the world of Java doesn't use optionals very regularly to express nullability. So it's not something that, that is pretty typically used mm -hmm. to handle nullability. Whereas yeah. in, in Scala, much more option is used. And in Kotlin, the, the options nulls, option types, are, types are, are huge. Yeah, um, option types make it really nice because you're forced to either, instead of having a null, you're basically forced to either be a sum type, which means I actually have a value, or none, which means I don't have a value. And the problem with a null is, I don't know, is a null like an error, like it didn't get set? Was it supposed to be empty? Like, why is it null? I don't know why it's null. Whereas with an option type, I, sum means I had a value, none means I don't. And so I know that there wasn't an exception, I just didn't have the value, so that's a really nice thing. So some nice language features there. Um, we are going to uh, continue on. So we, we talked through some of the nice language features that you will hopefully be able to modernize your Java with. And then uh, you saw some Kotlin for some null handling. Uh, that code is up on my GitHub. Uh, I want to go on now to something that will show some more language features in Kotlin, uh, but then also show some ecosystem things. Because I look at Java as an ecosystem, as a platform, and there's the language things that are modern, but then there's tools and there's libraries and frameworks that are also modernizing and, and making our lives easier. And so we're going to look at not just some of the language things, but also some of the ecosystem things. So to do this, I'm going to use a Spring Boot application. We'll so so James, I'm really curious, how many people are using Kotlin? Kotlin here. Is anyone using Kotlin? Oh, wow. That's great. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. About half the room's using That's Kotlin. Great. Nice. Okay. They're already modernized. All yeah. right. <laughs> um, so, okay, so let's do the Spring Boot Kotlin application. And uh, to, to start out, what I want to show is uh, I'm going to do some test driven development here. I'm going to start by running the tests for my Spring Boot application. And this will uh, dive us into some of the modern stuff that I, I really like in the Java ecosystem. So this is running Gradle and uh, for my Spring Boot application. And we'll compile the code, obviously, and then start up my tests. But there's something cool that's happening here, which I really like, is my test is an integration test. And it depends on Postgres, the Postgres database. And so I'm actually just spun up a Docker container for Postgres as part of my integration test, ran my integration test against that Postgres, and then it got shut down. Uh, and that all happened automatically. So this is using something called test containers, which is one of my favorite new things in the, the Java ecosystem. And tell us about test containers. Test containers are amazing. The basic idea is that I can, all I do is I declare my build a test container. I can declare like a Postgres test container, and then it will automatically spin up Docker, run the test container, or you know, Postgres in that test container for me, you know, and set up that test environment, and then shut it down at the end of the test. What's really nice about this is now developers don't, you know, when you have a new developer come into a team, you don't have to say, all right, set up Postgres, you know, and put in this schema to populate with this data, set up Kafka, you know, set up Spark, you know, in all these different environments, and they spend two weeks setting up their environment. Instead, all I do is, in your build, you already have everything defined in these test containers, and they don't have to, there's like almost no overhead to setting up the environment. 
The other huge thing is, you know, you have a Postgres database. I run tests against it every time I spin it. You know, if I maintain it locally, I have to clean out the, you know, my schema, clean out all the data, reset everything, and there's like all this overhead time of every single time I run a test to reset my entire environment back to zero. So. Yeah, so just like that, managing the life cycle of your service dependencies is super helpful. Uh, the test containers, the, you can use the fully like automatically managed life cycle stuff that you saw here. You can also have more fine-grained control over the life cycle of the test containers. Let's say you want your test container to run for a whole suite of tests. You can do that. Let's say you want it to run for each individual test. Let's say you want to, if you run it for each individual test, let's say you want to paralyze your tests. You can do that because the ports are randomized and you can run multiple containers all at the same time. Uh, and it will feed the configuration into your application automatically. So lots of different ways that you can do it. This is, if you've used Docker Compose, this is in some ways kind of like Docker Compose, except for the lifecycle is managed by the application, not some external thing, which is really nice for me. And I use test containers for local development and for my integration tests. So you can use them, them for both. That's actually huge too, because oftentimes the developer de developing against their local environment, and you know, they manually set Postgres Kafka and they've done some weird configurations that doesn't get translated into your QA and integration environments and then the tests break once you deploy the QA. Whereas test containers avoids all of that because you have this fixed environment that translates from local development all the way up into prod if you need to. So remember back in the day we would use H2, uh, oh, yeah. the in-memory database, and You try to H2 simulate was, Postgres. Yeah, exactly. H2 was great for the developer experience, but it was terrible because I would run into bugs in production that I didn't run into with local development because I was using a different database. Base. And test containers allows us to use the, the, same, the same services yes. uh, across all our environments, which is super nice. Yeah. Um, so all based on Docker containers, but there's now a cloud service called Atomic Jar. So you don't have to actually run the Docker containers on your machine. You can use the Atomic Jar cloud service instead and run them in the cloud, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of exciting stuff for me happening with test containers, making my productivity better, uh, making sure I, I have consistency of environments. Um, the other thing that I use test containers for, which is kind of cool, is I have a lot of projects where I've got like a microservice that depends on another microservice that depends on another microservice. I actually have configured my build so that as part of my build process, it'll build the containers for the dependent microservices then start up test containers, because test containers don't just have to be Postgres and Kafka and that sort of thing. They can be your application as well. And so then I spin up the test containers for my dependent uh, microservices and start those as part of my development process as well. So lots of cool stuff there happening with test containers. OK, so that's uh, test containers. Let's go look at how that's actually configured. So um, I'm going to start with my database configuration here for my Spring application. So with test containers and Spring, they have support built into it to be able to just specify a connection string that will automatically, when a connection is being made, spin up that test container. So that's the way that in this case, I've chosen to control the lifecycle of my Postgres test container is just by putting in this connection string. So pretty nice and convenient for, for doing that. You'll see that I'm using R2DBC, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But um, uh, yeah, and that's, that's all I had to do. You will see that this is just in my test uh, source directory is where I configure that. So in production, obviously, I'm not going to use the test container. Uh, I'm going to use my real production uh, Postgres database. And uh, so that's, um, that's how I configured that. So let's take a look at the code and walk through some of the stuff that, some of the other modern stuff that's going on here. So the first thing I want to dive into is my actual test that we ran. And I have a bar repo that I'm using in my test. And I want to go look at that bar repo. So first, we've got our bar repo, which is a coroutine CRUD repository. So this is an API that it comes from the R2 uh, DBC project in Spring, which is the reactive database project. So this creates a reactive database, non-blocking database connection to my Postgres database and exposes the interface to that through Kotlin coroutines that we'll talk about in a little bit. But before we talk about reactive and coroutines, I want to point out my bar is my data class, which is very similar to the Java record. And it has 
has a ID, which is a nullable because that comes from, gets assigned by the database. So before the database assigns it, it's null. And then my, my name on there. Okay, so let's, um, you and I have been doing Reactive for a, a while. A long time. Let's, tell us about Reactive and why it's awesome and why everybody should I be mean, doing it. I mean, the biggest thing about Reactive is it's non blocking. So the, the biggest problem with old school like JDBC drivers was you had one, you know, to, to connect, you had a client that connected into your, your web server that hold that, you know, thread for that client connection, block that thread. You only had a thread pool of 10, and so I'm limited to the number of connections. And then that same, Client would go and connect to the database, and it would block on that thread to the database. And it's holding on to that. And so what you end up with is a lot of resource contention around these threads, and it's completely blocking all the way through. It's just super painful. Yeah, yeah so the, you've got the overhead of the thread, which you really, like, you don't want to have thousands, tens of thousands of threads, threads on your machine. And one, there's memory overhead yeah. to those threads. Yeah. Two, there's, there's CPU mm -hmm. contention, contention with the thread like thread switching mm -hmm. uh, yeah. on the operating system. So it's just mm -hmm. as a waste of resources to use threads when, you, when you're not actually doing anything, right? Yeah, and you're basically blocked on holding that thread. And, and especially like when I go out to the database and read from the database, that thread is being held onto for, you know, like could be, you know, several seconds when it could be being used by another resource. So. Yeah. So it's just as about resource efficiency is the whole point, point of Reactive, right? Uh, so the Spring folks, as I said, they created the R2DBC database driver, which is being used under the covers here with the Coroutine CRUD repository. There is also, if you're in the world of Java, the Reactor CRUD repository, which will give you a Reactor interface to that non-blocking database access. So, and I think there's drivers for R2DBC for MySQL, Postgres and Oracle, I think are the three databases that they support. So you can do non-blocking access to those databases. This is not JDBC. So JDBC is a blocking protocol, and so they had to invent a new protocol in order to be non-blocking. Um, okay, so we've got our coroutine CRUD repository. Let's go back to our test and see what's actually happening. So I've got my integration test that is making sure that my bar repo works. And you'll see that I'm uh, doing the, wrapping this into a run blocking block. And the reason for that is that uh, I'm doing non-blocking stuff in my actual test, but I don't my test, it shouldn't be non-blocking. My test needs to block. I need, I need my test to fully complete execution um, before things move on. And so I have to tell it, all right, I'm going to block on this whole thing, uh, this whole block of, blo of non-blocking code. <laughs> okay, so then we get into our bar repo save method. And the save method is where we first encounter something non-blocking here. And so I'm making this save call, which is non-blocking, and Colin has built into it a way to express async non-blocking stuff through something called coroutines. The way that this works is that you'll see that there's that keyword suspend in front of the function, and suspend functions are asynchronous. But what's weird is that I'm calling this save method and then immediately assigning it to this value bar. And how does that work if that's actually asynchronous underneath the covers? So it turns out that Kotlin takes this asynchronous code and kind of unravels it into like the callback style that you would imagine it maintains this like state machine of what's actually happening so that I as a developer don't have to write code in that asynchronous kind of annoying style. I get to write it in this like imperative style where it looks like things are just flowing, you know, without uh, in a fully blocking way, but actually underneath the covers this gets unrolled into non-blocking asynchronous code. So that's the, the power of Kotlin coroutines. Now, uh, on the horizon is something that will enable us to do this in the world of Java called Loom, where we'll get the similar style way of doing async and non-blocking in, in this style, but without having to do the callbacks. And so, uh, so exciting stuff happening in the, the Loom area of Loom as well. But that still is on the horizon. 
Okay, so then I've got my test. I'm going to assert that my, uh, that my bar that I got out of the database, its ID is not null. And then I'm calling another method here on my bar repo, which is find all. And if we look at the return type of find all, that returns a flow of T. And flow is the Kotlin coroutines stream. And so that's a non-blocking reactive stream. And so again, this is all non-blocking, but I can just assign that to my bars. And then I can call count on it uh, and call first and that sort of thing. Do my uh, typical stream operations on that as if it is is, is all there, but really it is this async non-blocking stream underneath the covers. Okay, so that's my test and some of the, the language features around coroutines and non-blocking. Let's go take a look now at our actual application, uh, our, our REST controller here. So I've got my REST controller, which takes my bar repo as a constructor parameter, and then I've got a git mapping for slash bars, and in my get bars method, it returns a flow of bar, so that's my stream of bars out of the database, and you'll see I marked that with suspend function because it's using coroutines, and now I just call my find all method and return my flow of bars, so pretty straightforward on that one. Then I've got my post mapping for add bar where I parse the request into a bar and then I save it to the database and then I return a HTTP response of no content. So, so that's, that's my whole REST controller, pretty straightforward on that uh, front, all async and non-blocking. So here's part of the cool thing here is that my whole application end-to-end -end now is reactive. It's all non-blocking. So an HTTP request comes in that fires off a request to the database to get the bars. And in the time that I'm waiting for the database to respond, there is no threads allocated to that request. Those threads go away. The request is still open. The connection is still open. This is the power of NIO uh, underneath the covers. And Netty is what powers it. But that, so the request is still open, but there's no threads allocated to handling that request until the database response comes back. Then we get the thread back, and then we can send the response back to the user. So that's how all that works underneath the covers. And really just about efficiency of resources on our system. Anything to add on that? No, it's just so much easier than the old school, like where you had to do like a sync block around your <laughs> database code and all that. So yeah, definitely a lot more straightforward. Okay, so that's our uh, our REST application. Let's go now and uh, go on to the next cool thing that I want to point out is. We uh, now, most of us are containerizing our applications, turning them into Docker OCI mm -hmm. containers, and then deploying them on Kubernetes or wherever you want to run your containers. And so there's uh, a nice feature that has been added into Spring Boot to containerize the applications that I want to show you. So let's go and containerize our Spring Boot application. We're going to call this boot build image, and we're going to tell it the image name is Spring po uh, Kotlin Postgres. And let's run that. So what's actually happening underneath the covers is that this is using something called build packs. And build packs are not just a, a Java thing. You can use them with lots of different technologies. You can use build packs to build Python and Go and Ruby and you know, all sorts of whatever, Node. Um, but the Spring Boot folks have used build packs to containerize Spring Boot applications and built in support into Gradle and Maven to do that. And so it now just built my container image for me. Uh, so it compiled my application and then built the container image and layered things in a nice way. I've got my operating system. I've got my JVM. I've got my dependency layer. I've got my application layer. So that just creates good cache and validation structures. And so now my container image is created. Um, let's go over and just go check out what's actually in this container image. So dive is a tool that lets us actually see what's inside of our container image. We can see I've got my operating system layer that's like 63 megs. I've got some other layers in here. Then I've got my JVM layer that's 144 megs. Then I've got a 34 meg layer, which is my dependencies. And then further down, I think this two meg layer is my actual application. So I've got my container image uh, created by, by my um, uh, created by the build packs, the cloud native build packs, and really nice feature for building any, you can use build packs to, to uh, turn any Java, any JVM application into a container image. I'm gonna start up my Docker container so that we can we actually have, we run have five this more thing. Minutes. Five mm -hmm. more minutes, perfect. 
Okay, so I'm starting up my Spring application. You'll see that it is now making a connection to my Postgres database. I'm not using test containers in this case. Uh, it took about five seconds to start up my Spring application. Let's go over and test our Spring application, make sure it works. I'm going to make a post request, and that should return no content. Great, my bar was stored to the database. Now let's go make our get request, and we see there's my list of bars coming out of my Postgres database. So great, my Docker image worked. I'm able to run it, and that is all good. But there is something cooler we can do with this application. So we, um, that all worked well. We've got our JVM-based application, but there's another new and exciting thing in modern Java land called GraalVM native image. GraalVM native image allows us to ahead of time compile a JVM-based application into a native executable. And so you want to tell us about GraalVM native image and your yeah. uses of it? Well, I mean, so we're working on a, a, a large distributed compute cluster that had to compute like millions of financial calculations. And you know, we built this compute cluster, it runs great, but the problem was it was really expensive. And so we needed a way to basically spin things up really fast, run the calculations, and then shut it down and be very resource, uh, you know, um, you know, not effective. Use much memory. Not use very much memory. And so what we've done is we start to use Graal VM. And the advantage with Graal VM is like that our application would, was taking on average like 200 megabytes. With Graal VM, it's now down to about 30 megabytes of memory usage. Startup times have gone from, you know, three to five seconds down to about six milliseconds of startup time. So we can spin everything up, do the calculations faster, and use a lot less resources. So GraalVM has been like a huge cost savings for us. And, and that's one of the big advantages is in a cloud environment of these cost saving times. And oftentimes when you have a lot of, you know, millions of like small calculations you want to spin up and shut down, GraalVM is ideal for this because you're really saving on the cost of compute and CPU and everything, so. Nice. Yeah, so GraalVM native image, it's pretty amazing that you can take a JVM-based application and ahead of time compile it, get rid of the JVM, and, and really get some great optimizations and performance improvements there. For the case with Spring Boot, to enable the usage of GraalVM native image, we just set a couple flags here for the boot build image task. We tell it to turn on the BP native image, set the, the build pack Java version uh, to 17, and then you can even compress the image that's created with the tool called UPX. So those are the parameters that I used. And then we would just call the normal boot build image and be able to create our native image. It does take a few minutes because it's doing a lot of work to ahead of time compile this JVM-based application down into a native executable. So this is something that I just save and do in my CI CD pipeline. I don't do this as part of my local dev cycle. When in local dev, I'm on the JVM, and then for my native images, put those into my, my CI CD pipeline. Okay, so I'm not gonna actually build it here. I've already built it. So let's go use that dive tool and go check out our container image now that was created with native image. You'll see that now my base operating system layer, 17 megs, and then I think that my this 23 meg layer is my whole application that was compiled down into a native executable. No more JVM layer, just this native executable now. Uh, and so that's uh, you know some savings just on the container image, not having to download as big of a container image. There are some downsides to this. I no longer get the nice cache, uh, the nice caching of my layers. You know, in the typical JVM application, if you uh, only change your application layer, then it's only going to have to pull that one new layer uh, on a new pull. Whereas this, any any change that I make to anything, it's going to have to repull the whole container image. So there's some trade-offs there. But let's go now start up our Docker container image for the native version of this. And you'll see that that started in well under a second. So much faster startup time. If you're in serverless or in a workload environment like Ryan's, where you need things to start up fast, use less memory, then this is the same application, just starting a whole lot faster. And again, there are trade-offs to this. Uh, one is that the, the JIT is really good at, over time, warming up and doing a lot of optimizations. Uh, a warm JIT can be really uh, a lot faster than something that's ahead of time compiled. Because when you're ahead of time compiling something, you're making some assumptions about 
what needs to be optimized, whereas the JIT can continue to improve and continue to make things faster. So, um, so you may not see the same performance benefits in an ahead of time compiled version as you would in a warm JIT version. So, um, so yeah, lots of, lots of uh, trade-offs there, but definitely some exciting things happening. GraalVM native image you can use with any JVM application. I've showed it in Spring Boot. There are some limitations with re reflection. There are some challenges with reflection because to do ahead of time, you have to know all the code paths. And so Spring Native has done a good job. Corcus and Micronaut have done a good job at alleviating some of those challenges around reflection, but definitely can still run into some challenges there. So anyways, that is uh, a quick look at some of the great tools and uh, exciting things, modern things in the Java ecosystem. Uh, and you can find the code for that one up on my GitHub as well. So I think we have some time for questions, right? No, we used it all. We used it all the time. So mm -hmm. I'll be around, Ryan, I'll, I'll be around if you have other questions. But I hope that was useful for you all. Thank you so much for coming. Thank Thanks. you, everyone. Thanks.